However, capturing all the possibility space of what we do as 3D artists and fitting it to rigid descriptions is a very hard problem if we think about it in a context of traditional tools. Can we actually hardcore all the artistic knowledge, even though sometimes we ourselves cannot explain certain intuitive decisions we make on a daily basis? That's exactly why about a year ago I became very interested in machine learning and the work that has been produced by its community. Whereas in procedurism we tend to handcraft every single rule, machine learning offers quite a different mindset where you provide examples and the machine tries to model the rules that fit your data. So instead of making an algorithm that solves the problem, you are building an architecture that is able to learn how to solve a set of problems in general. But before we fasten ourselves in the deep learning hype train, I think it is important to mention that we should stay critical and keep in mind those are just um, tools to help us to get from A to B, those are not magic ones, and we shouldn't get attached to them. The same way we should not get attached to the mountains we are so used to climbing and get stuck in a weird, abusive relationship. Anyway, my first acquaintance with deep learning started with uh, a subfield of machine learning. Um, that they, yeah, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning, for those of you who don't know. And it started for me the journey with style transfers about a year ago. I remember how I was just mind blown by the results I saw. Um, because I've never heard about machine learning before, or neural networks even, and it just looked like complete magic. And magic, I really wanted to understand how it worked. So, for example, in this work, a deep learning architecture is given an input painting, which you can see on the um, bottom left, and it applies a style it has learned from this a painting to any photo that you can input, which is, in this case, is photo number A. And notice that we do not need to write a separate algorithm for every single painting or a new picture we might want to stylize because neural networks can generalize to any image input. And some te techniques can even be applied to videos. So let's see if I can make it uh, run. Does it actually play? Yeah, it does. So, so I'm just going to scroll through it because uh, so here you can see that we can apply a style of a painting to a whole video. And when I saw it, I just couldn't help but question, can this be like a post-processing photo for our games? What if we even just define a white box level, we have some kind of training data from artists, and neural net can just synthesize actual art on top of the white box level, just as a post-processing. Another super interesting work that you probably heard about is Deep Dream by Google. So what is happening here is that the neural network has been trained to classify objects in images, such as towers, buildings, or birds, and once the model is trained, we can ask it to modify the input image to look more like a tower or a building or a bird because that's what it's used to seeing. And that's kind of where you get very tricky results because like, you, your leaves become more like birds. Or for example, it was funny because they released this code and they trained it mostly on dogs and cats. So all the people were getting dogs and cats everywhere. <laughs> or another interesting and impressive work uh, that has been done in the area of image to image translation is where you can convert edges to a full purse, for example, or labels to buildings, and the neural network just fills in based on the training all the missing data from your input. And they also released it as an interactive demo, which is called Pix to Pix, and you could create cats from edges. So some people became super creative, <laughs> creating rat cats and tentacle cats. But uh, as you can see, because this neural network was trained exclusively on cats, it has no idea about anything else, where it just draws cats all the time. And of course, images are only one domain. Huge advances have been made in many areas, such as object detection, speech synthesis, text, and also animation. And in regarding the animations, there's a super impressive result. We present a real time character yes, control system using a novel neural network structure. Yes. <laughs> so, um, in this example, they have a character that is being controlled by a neural network. And if anyone's curious, I really advise to read the paper, it's very interesting. But basically, the only input they have is where the character has to move. And um, all the training data is just a mocap data, which they label by hand. But still, it was so much less work than creating a huge state machine that they used to having. And this character could adapt to terrain, is a movement called supernatural, because it was not just playing a certain state, it was actually, it learned how the movement should look like based on the input and the um, terrain. So. And I'd like to show you also some of the work from our group seat. Um, for example, the latest one was a deep learning agents playing Battlefield 1, because who says that we can't give neural nets the same controls players have and let them play the game? So, and this one I hope. One, two, 
what you're about to see are early results of an experiment, a collaboration between DICE and C, where self-learning agents play a basic Battlefield 1 game mode. All players you see are controlled by a single neural network that has been trained to play the game from scratch through trial and error. To help the agents get started, we've added supplies around the map. The green cubes give help, and brown cubes provide ammo. The agents have learned to adapt their behavior if they're low on ammo or health, like this agent. Everything the agents do is the result of previous gameplay experience. We only give them encouragement for playing the objective. Following an agent's first-person perspective provides a unique insight into its behavior. While their basic skills are impressive, they get easily confused and have many things left to learn. We are still confident that machine learning will profoundly change game development and gaming experiences in the years to come. Click the link in the description to explore the promise of neural networks and machine learning in games.
even like here I drew only one neuron, but you can expand this. So if, for example, in every layer we can have multiple neurons, which will look something like this. <laughs> and then you just um, vectorize it. So you just expand all your weights and biases just to matrices. Um, so I'll not go into too many details, but trust me, it's actually quite simple. And here, well, this is all of our learnable parameters, and the orange ones are the ones provided by the user. So in this, for example, simple three-layer network with seven neurons, we have about 22 learnable parameters. But sometimes neural nets can have like million of parameters. For example, I recently learned that VGG16, which is like a benchmark for image classification on thousands of classes, it's about 167 million parameters. So <laughs> how do we find the correct values for every single parameter that will match our provided samples of x to y? And if you have seen Pixar's lifted where an alien is passing sort of an exam and abducting a human, and the control panel before him is like this infinite similar looking knobs, I think that's pretty much how neural net feels at first. <laughs> Just like trying to get where to put stuff. But um, thankfully they can't complain, and the process of tweaking is not completely random, because searching through all the space of possibilities would take infinity. So just as an alien is kind of looking after his supervisor on this GIF, it's kind of the same, uh, we're using calculus and derivatives to tell us whether tweaking this knob right here, well, uh, a tiny bit, will actually lead us closer to predicting the real value y provided by the user. And we do this small tiny updates many, many times until we minimize a so-called cost function or the error, which is just another estimate of how different our predictions of the neural net are from the reality provided by the user. <coughs> And once we train the network on enough samples, and usually they require, as I have mentioned before, a lot of samples, like thousands or even millions of samples, so because the bigger your data set, the better usually your neural network performs, then we can give it new X inputs for which we ourselves don't know the answers. And as I said, this should provide us sensible outputs. And the exploration of these ideas has produced a couple of small, simple experiments, some of which I'm going to show you now, and also talk about how we can deploy uh, deep learning today within the procedural community. And since deep learning requires big training data sets, one of the most obvious advantages of proceduralism is we can generate pretty much infinite and very clean training data that we can produce with handcrafted algorithms. So when I started with getting into deep learning, one of the first tests I did was learning the placement of three assets based on a single terrain example. And the idea that we can take a new terrain and set a volume of points, and then we ask for every single point in the predict data right there, is it a tree? And it was literally my first machine learning project, so I only knew how to do simple binary classification. So as you can see from the dense input volume, the network just picked only those points that had, that had high enough probability of being a tree based on the training that it had. And that looked quite plausible, considering that it never seen such a terrain before. Yeah, and the training data, you can see that's, that's how it looks, <laughs> kind of uh, very random, but um, it actually consists of valid examples, so I just did like scattering out with some rules. And then I just also did some unvalid exa invalid examples, which I explicitly said to the network, look, those are not trees. And it was quite fun since I got to play with multiple machine learning algorithms, not just neural network. However, one of the main problems of such an approach uh, became what parameters should be assigned in this case to trees. Because in, I uh, had like a distance to other trees, the slope it was on, and other parameters, but those were again handcrafted, and how many and what information is relevant in this case. Therefore, such a workflow inevitably leads us to that end of handcrafting attributes, and also requires us to label our training data, which might not seem like a terribly big deal, but imagine labeling every single asset instance in today's massive scale games, and also assigning all the meaningful parameters to them. Plus, we need to provide negative examples, which is also kind of a tricky problem. Sometimes an artist hasn't placed, let's say, a glass like right here, Oops. But it doesn't mean that it would be an invalid placement. So we don't want to take responsibility for saying, no, you cannot put class here. So next step was to see whether we can skip handcrafting attributes and only provide some kind of spatial awareness of the surroundings that would be general for any placement. And for that test, I didn't want to create a new network from scratch, but I wanted some kind of more complex rules than just scattering on a slope. So I decided to go with the lake houses. And for those of you who don't know, Lake House is a Houdini project that generates this type of houses completely from scratch, so it seemed like an ideal candidate. So what I do there, in order to accommodate for the spatial awareness, is I'm taking this multidimensional volume, where for every voxel, we look at all six faces of that voxel, so right, left, top, bottom, front, and back. And for every location, we write a one-hot representation of what it is. It can be a door, a window, stairs, or something else. 
So it looks something like this. So imagine we are looking at this voxel right here, which has a window. So we know that this has an orientation of x, and it's a window. And one hot representation is just encoding its kind of like zero one uh, version that can be interpreted by a machine learning algorithm. So in this case, we're writing like a very big array where, for example, for every x, we're writing all the possible classes. So that 001 basically means that it's not a wall, it's not a door, but it's a window. And the ones who train, the ones who write the data, it looks something like this. A very pretty, very human readable. <laughs> but uh, hey, there are patterns here that neural net can pick up. Because for humans, maybe it's impossible to pick it up, but surprisingly, neural net does very well. Because even though back then I only knew the most basic fully connected neural networks with only like three layers, which was almost straight out of like make your own neural network book, the test worked with 97% accuracy. So what neural net was getting is uh, just the uh, wolf, and it had to uh, label the walls of what it would place there. So in yellow here is windows, blue are doors, and pink are staircases, and there's also dark and green, which would be like supports for, um, in cases like an overhang. And it placed those with 97% accuracy, which was actually super surprising for me, and very encouraging. And the most interesting thing that I kind of noticed is that suddenly I didn't like for an original uh, Houdini network, um, I had to voxelize this in order to account for self intersection. I had to do ray tracing. I had to write a lot of code. Sometimes took some time to check for all the possibilities, and it took time. But suddenly here with neural net, it took milliseconds. I could label everything here in milliseconds, and I was like, huh, that would be a very neat speed up to any Houdini generation, not just like this particular example, because suddenly we can run non real time algorithms in mere milliseconds if we can compress them with neural nets. And of course, we are losing this 100% certainty that it will work, because you will almost never get 100% certainty with neural nets. Uh, but it's a kind of a trade-off, because 97% is actually really good. Because uh, if you're working as an artist, and you can get this immediate feedback, if, and if you see one case in 100 fail, you're just like, OK, just generate a new one. Just give it a second. It's not a big deal. Another cool part is that I found that Houdini to be quite a comfortable platform for generating all the training data and visualizing the prediction. So that's how my neural, uh, neural net, that's how my <laughs> network looks like. And um, the red one is I'm generating a training data, and the orange one is the test data. The test data is used to validate accuracy because we need to provide examples it never seen before. And this um, green one is I'm just visualizing what is actually happening because well I, I can't read them those zeros so that I can tell what was actually correct. And this is, of course, just labeling already pre-existing structures. But how about generating something from scratch? Can neural nets do that? And there are generative techniques. And one of the most popular ones is probably generative adversarial network. And here's a result where we train it on a couple of thousands of generated levels layouts we actually did for Pika Pika. And this is kind of the training steps that the algorithm has. So the top row is kind of the example to provide. And the bottom row is. Uh, what it produced. So as you can see in the very beginning, it's just absolute noise gibberish, but it actually picks up quite fast what it has to do. And the coolest part is actually really generated new examples that were never present in the training data set. Like in, um, hmm, let me see if I can, oh, unfortunately not in this picture, but sometimes it was generating actually separate islands of uh, the layout, which was never in the training data, but it was actually a completely valid uh, placement based on the rules we provided, which was kind of cool and surprising. And also, it's always very satisfying to watch it train. <laughs> but um, one of the actually problems that it had, it was very hard for it to learn to connect the lines all the way to the end. So I'm not sure if it's visible, but sometimes you can see a bit of fuzziness in the generation. And again, it's, um, as I said before, it will, it will probably never be 100% accurate. But if you are willing to do the trade-off to speed up your algorithm, I think it's a very interesting direction. And um, if we, But perhaps you don't have time to actually explore this um, architectures, because this one was just built uh, by me in Keras uh, library, which is the TensorFlow-based library for deep learning. Um, but there are actually um, a lot of code already publicly available. For example, fix to fix is available on GitHub. And here is a model that I trained. It took me like 20 minutes to set up uh, the repository, about three hours to generate 400 random procedural strokes and corresponding eroded mountains with Houdini on my laptop at home. And then about another four hours to train the network uh, at work. And then we have real-time erosion with, honestly, very minimal effort. And previously, it took around 20 seconds for a single erosion frame. And now you can have this in real time. 
And this algorithm, by the way, doesn't know about previous frames. It cal recalculates every frame, so there's kind of a bit of a jitter when uh, generation is being done. But I actually was quite surprised how little j jitter there is. I was expecting much more, so it's also pretty cool. And uh, the moment the pix to pix is kind of limited to 256 by 256. But if you know TensorFlow and if you are willing to invest time into learning deep, uh, deep learning, deep learning um, you can easily modify it and account for a high resolution. And if you want to try to maybe implement even from scratch as a learning, uh, I really, I really advise to uh, check out interactive example-based terrain offering with conditional generative adversarial networks. <laughs> Did you remember? Good. <laughs> 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 good. <laughs> so yeah, but I think it's a great example of actually using uh, neural nets for game production. Because the paper, I think, specifically was aimed to uh, leverage the uh, erosion for game terrains. But yeah, but does it always work? Because I already mentioned the fuzziness, <laughs> and I already said it's definitely not a magic wand. It is a very iterative and actually quite time-consuming process that also requires a change in debugging mindset. And what I mean by this is that usually we are used to seeing results immediately after we did some change to our code, because yeah, it's instant, we have instant feedback. Whereas with deep learning, it might vary from a couple of hours to a couple of days to validate the change in your code and actually see whether you did better or worse. And it is rather hard to debug. You can ask anyone. There's like even separate studies dedicated to understanding how neural networks think. But sometimes it can surprise you and make you smile at, uh, in the morning after overnight tests. So this is a pig. It, it may, it's like we were asking neural net to imagine a pig from an angle it has never seen before. And well, <laughs> the result is straight out of a disturbing nightmare. But um, you maybe you can even recognize it's actually a pig head from Houdini. <laughs> That's what it was but yeah, so to sum up uh, what proceduralism can, and deep learning can do today, no, first of all it's procedural data that we can use to either only test or even fully train deep neural networks. I think about maybe even procedural environments that help deep learning agents to generalize better of navigating the environments. Secondly, neural nets can be an amazing compression mechanism for expensive algorithms. Just like the example with erosion I showed you, you can optimize something non-real time into a real time tool, or at least even parts of your network, which already allows you for a much better creative experience, as you can see your input influencing your output much faster, if you're willing to invest into the training of that model. And thirdly, and one I haven't talked much, is we can use neural nets to combine networks by manipulating our train set. So it was a very quick test uh, I did. And basically what you see here on top is the training data. And in training data, I always showed neural net circles, squares, and triangles separately. They were never together. However, after being taught on those examples, the deep learning network actually started combining them when it was asked to generate new outputs, which was very interesting because it started to kind of merge those three separate networks into one. And a similar test was done like with the reaction diffusion just straight lines, and I especially like how it just takes some reaction diffusion and just continues it in a straight line because it's seen both examples and both are valid for it. And again, it's like if, if you are kind of <laughs> a bit uh, familiar with deep learning, learning networks and just can use some kind of keras library, this takes about 10 minutes to set up and maybe like half an hour to train. Yeah, and in the future, remember how I talked about what we um, procedural artists repeatedly do? Perhaps that can be an inspiration to what neural nets help us with as well. For example, creating hierarchical algorithmic, represent hierarchical algorithmic representations from just visual research. Just imagine you put uh, Elisinski paintings and you just ask it to create a Houdini network for you. Or maybe sequence of actions one needs to perform in Maya, which might in turn create kind of a curious demand for AI-oriented modeling software. Who knows? That would be quite curious. Because, well, we already have a Pika Pika, which was a game only for AI agents, so why stop there? But, so I hope it's kind of captured your interest and it was a bit inspirational. And if it was, then here is a bunch of suggestions on where to start. And I do recommend going through implementing a neural net from scratch, even if it's the most basic one, because it really helps you to understand what is happening behind the hood and not just consider it magic. And Make Your Own Neural Network is a very friendly book to start with, so really recommend that one. And I also highly advise watching MIT Artificial Intelligence course by Patrick Winston. It's extremely inspirational, educational, and also very entertaining. <laughs> it's like, I just binged through it, it was, it was pretty amazing. And 
Of course, just read and implement existing papers, explore other people's implementation and code. And it's very important also, I think, to keep a learning journal where you write your discoveries, questions, and ideas. It really helps to structure the information, which is going to be a lot at first, especially if you don't come from computer science background. But it also motivates to see uh, how much you have already invested and gives you a sensation of progression and satisfaction. And I think my journal was like 100 pages and I just started a new one because it just became too hard to manage and hard to find stuff there. But even if we take a step back from deep learning for a moment and just, uh, I want to take this opportunity to admire this beautiful idea of connectionism, which is a set of approaches in the field of artificial intelligence that attempts to represent mental or behavioral phenomena as emergent processes of interconnected networks of simple units. And the most popular, of course, is neural nets right now. But I especially like this part, emergent process of interconnected networks of simple units, which is a very different mindset, where we hardcore every single rule right now in a very strict and precise manner, and we rarely leave room or even deliberately disallow any emergent behavior, to say the least emergent rules from user examples. And yes, I mean like emergent rules. But we have this approach of taking a lot of small and simple calculation units and making them work together to construct rules can inspire us for something new in the future. So yeah, that would be the end of my presentation. And if you're curious to learn more about our deep learning and other projects we do at SEED, I recommend to check out our blog at ea.com slash SEED. And I would also like to thank everyone at SEED for their just amazing energy, inspiration, and knowledge exchanges happening on a daily basis, as well as all of you for coming here today. And I actually really enjoyed the conference and all the conversations that emerged from gathering of so many interesting individuals. So thank you for being a part of it. Yeah. Encoder, for instance, to generate uh, Houdini networks? Not the Houdini networks, no, but I have tried out encoders and I think it's a really interesting idea. Uh, we mostly um, <laughs> tried it for, we were curious whether we can compress representation about 3D models into light and space, like, because it's a very interesting idea where you can compress basically to a couple of flows, a uh, very big data structure, but no, we haven't tried it on Houdini networks. I wish I could do it in Python Sops in Houdini, and by the way, the question is whether I, I'm using it in Python Sops, uh, the deep learning networks. Um, but unfortunately, on Windows, Python 3.5 is not supported, and TensorFlow is not supported <laughs> for 2.7 on Windows. So unless you have Linux, I'm afraid at the moment you can't have it in Houdini. But the workaround is, uh, I have just external Python running on 3.5, and I'm just calling Houdini from that external script, which, and I just say, hey, Houdini, generate me this bunch of training uh, data, and I just read that back to my external Python script. Any more questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got one. Okay. So, it's, it's for an artist or technical artist or efforts artist, this is very uh, academic. Right. How do you see that you can connect uh, bridge the uh, artistic world with these types of tools? Mm -hmm. so the question is how to connect this more of a design approach to artists and how to bridge uh, this, this approach with artistic uh, workflow. Is it correct? Yeah? Well, yes. even the, the, the concept of it is very alien to a regular mm -hmm. artist. So how do you make sure that they get most out of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's uh, allowing artists to kind of have a different mindset of actually showing what they want rather than explicitly giving the rules. I think that's the work at least I envision personally of how it would work. For example, you can again just provide a training data set of what you want or even maybe in the future when there are more one-shot learning examples where you just provide a single asset and you say I want something like this. So that's kind of how I envision artists being uh, in touch with this type of uh, technology and also being able to have a dialogue with them. Because a lot of times when you have some kind of generation, um, it's very hard to have like a dialogue with it. Whereas um, maybe in the future we'll be able to just yes, just give feedback to the neural nets and saying, okay, you did well, but here I don't like it, and we'll actually generate something new. Does it answer your question? Yeah, it's good. But don't you think that their artists are craftsmen, you know, in essence? So 
you know, there's going to be a conflict, I think. There's going to be a conflict of interest. We have, but I think also it's important to um, this type of technology might enable not just um, artists and developers, but also users outside of our industry. Mm -hmm. Just people, for example, if um, I don't know, a small girl wants to create a 3D world and she has no idea what Polygon is, suddenly she doesn't need to learn it anymore. She can just show what she wants. And I think that's kind of might be similar to kind of invention of a photo camera in a way. Like when the photo camera was invented, like craft didn't go anywhere from paintings, but suddenly it allowed a like it democratized capturing reality, so to say, for a mass audience. And I think that this is kind of the implication that might be of democratizing content create, uh, creation and generation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so most of what I've seen done with neural nets are like array type things. So yeah. like pictures, obviously, for example, uh, and maybe voxels, which is also array type things. Um, but has it been done properly to make 3D models out of poly? I don't think I've seen a lot of good examples. Do you have any good examples of that? I mean, I'm sure there are. Uh, Some things, maybe you can tell me. <laughs> Some uh, steps towards it. I think the most curious one was when they were taking basically a polygon sphere yeah. and they were deforming it to shape into the desired um, model. So that's kind of the closest one they got just using polygons and not like an array. But yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a it's a tricky question because of the way our neural nets work and the architecture, you need your input to be an array, yeah. sort of, like set, certain set of neurons. And you're working so most, which I think it works best when you work towards an array too, right? As an output, I guess, or, yes, I mean, don't you um, can, that mm -hmm. an array can be a bunch mm -hmm. of steps too, but maybe, I don't know how good it is. Yeah, that's why I think it might be interesting to teach uh, neural nets to actually use modeling software we're using right now, because there you can encode the, action space as an array. So you can say, okay, you yeah. can extrude, you can like transform, you can do that and this, and just do it as a reinforcement learning problem. It's a kind of similar to playing a game, but your goal is not to win like a objective, but your goal is to get to this a 3D model as close as possible, or a reference. Yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, yeah. So how do you get the deep learning AI into a game? Do you have to write it in the native code of the engine, or are you getting it from somewhere else, and where are you storing the data for that process? I'm actually not sure, but the tip I can give you is that Unity now deploying their machine learning framework, and it's now in beta, and there you can just, they have like something they call the brain, where you can actually just train the models, they have already a lot of models for you, and there you can just set up your um, limitations or constraints or uh, training data, and that's going to be natively for you in Unity. But um, I personally have no experience of deploying it in uh, in game, so I cannot answer that kind of question because but question. The demo showed deep learning agents, right? Yes. So well, how I've did that work? Is that different? I actually don't know the detail because I'm not a part of deep learning uh, group, and I have always not a part of that project in particular. So I actually don't know how to set it up. So, <laughs> sorry. Is there still a question yet? Uh, how viable is it to optimize game physics with deep learning? Can you Because I saw some stuff about that. Like there was actually a paper on uh, fluid simulation with neural network really optimized the time. And I was actually very good at predicting where the next kind of point would be. But I don't know the details. I haven't read the paper, but it might be interesting for you to check it out. Yeah, I, I think I saw the same paper as well. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. How viable is it? I, I don't know, actually. I have never, <laughs> I've never thought about it. but. Um, because with fluids, you have, right, for your train your, the, uh, your model, I would imagine you have an array of points, and you're just predicting where the next point would be. But if you have just general physics, and you don't know how many objects there are, not how many, like, then it would be a very fuzzy problem, because suddenly you don't know what your architecture should be like. So in that sense, it's kind of a bit of a limitation at the moment, probably. However, maybe there could be potential a smart work around that, but I, I don't know, I have nothing else to mind yet. Okay. You can always send